Thank you, Daniel, and good morning, church. It's good to be with you. If I've not met you yet or you're a guest, my name is Aaron. I get to be the pastor of our church, and you picked a great Sunday, even though it's a little rainy out, a little uh, misty. Um, It's that we're in the book of John, and uh, chapter 15, and it's one of these uh, hallmark, um, beautiful passages that are on coffee mugs and posters and paintings and everything. It's about Jesus being the vine, and we're the branches to abide in Him. So you picked a good Sunday, and we've just been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all through the book of John. Uh, Now, one announcement, a couple of you guys were asking, hey, where are Bradley and Haley? And they gave me permission to share with you that they had their little girl last night, Sophie, at 1014. That's right. 1014 last night. So if you guys are watching online, we're excited for you, praying for you guys. And uh, yeah, mom is healthy, Haley's healthy, and baby Sophie is healthy. Uh, They've got some family that's in town and taking care of them and the other two boys that they have. And so we just rejoice with them and celebrate their new baby. Um, So with that said, guys, uh, let's jump in here to uh, John chapter 15. If you're taking notes, it's called this, Abiding in the Vine, How God's Love Produces a Joyful and Fruitful Life. Now, guys, if you're familiar with the Bible, the Bible uses a ton of analogies, ton of analogies, especially to relate about God's relationship with his people. For example, the Bible used the imagery of a father, and we are his beloved, what? Children, right? In Psalm 23, we see another analogy. We see God being a caring shepherd, looking after us, his cherished sheep. And we also see in the New Testament letters, there's a few illustrations there as well. We see that God is the builder and we are his building, that he is building up on the cornerstone of Christ. And so in today's passage, guys, we're going to see another beautiful analogy about God's relationship with his people and what that looks like. And in John 15, we see this gardening analogy about vine and branches. Uh, Now, my wife Emily will tell you uh, that I am terrible with plants, awful with plants. I know nothing about them or how to keep them alive. I have a zero success rate, batting a zero percent. I even accidentally killed Emily's favorite house plant of five years. She named him Gary. And when I forgot to water him, when she was out of town, Gary is no longer with us. R.I.P. Gary the plant. So as you can imagine, guys, as I'm reading this passage for the first time, maybe in my uh, Christian life several years ago, um, it felt a little bit foreign to me. This plant and this vine and this branches and a vine dresser, this fruit. What does this have to do with? I'm not a gardener. I like to play baseball. And so I had no idea what this was. And so I pray that today you'll join me in seeing the riches and the beauty of this analogy, even if you have no familiarity with it. For I believe that this passage, guys, is going to show us three things about what God's love does in our life, what it produces in our life. So three things we're going to look at is this. You must be connected to the right vine. The next thing we'll see is you must let the vine dresser do his job, which is to prune us. And then we must learn how to abide in that vine. So the right vine, understanding what God's pruning means and how do we abide in this vine. So guys, let's jump in this passage and we're going to see uh, how Jesus intros this analogy starting in verse one. He says this, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. This is the analogy. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every uh, branch that does produce fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. Now, pause there. Now, guys, Jesus is a master storyteller. If you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see in all of those, he uses all sorts of illustrations and stories and metaphors. And Jesus is doing it right here again in John 15. He's a master storyteller and he's weaving in all the people that are currently in the room with him into this illustration. For if you remember guys, John 15 is situated right in between John 13 and John 17, which that whole entire section is a conversation over dinner. It's this famous upper room dialogue where Jesus is gathering with his 12 just hours from his crucifixion and then day's resurrection. And he's having this last conversation from John 13 to John 17. And he's talking to them. He's using this illustration. He's incorporating everyone in the room. Jesus is incorporating all the disciples, this, all the disciples into this analogy. So check it out with me. Look in verse 1. 
Jesus first tells us, sort of like this uh, theater director, he's giving out parts to who's in the room. And he's saying, hey, listen, my part is I am the vine, which we'll talk about in a moment. And he says, God, the father, because Jesus is a part of a, a triune trinity, a triune God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. He says, God, the father is the vine dresser. Well, then in verse two and three, we learn some other roles in this analogy. He says that the branches that bear fruit, well, who are those? They represent the 11 disciples who have trusted in Jesus and therefore they're connected in commune with him. That's what these branches that bear fruit are. Well, then lastly, there's one more part to play. There's branches that don't bear fruit that we'll see in this passage. And those branches symbolize Judas, who were not truly connected to Jesus by faith in him, because he's just trying to relate to Jesus by getting something from him. Jesus is treating Jesus kind of like this cosmic vending machine. He puts in a request and hopes to get something out, but no relationship with the vending machine. And, or he treats him like a cosmic genie of some sorts. And just if I just kind of rub the right prayer and I do the right thing and have the right action, then I'll get some thing from God. And Jesus is saying that those who treat God this way and have no connection with him and no faith and trust in him, they're like these branches that don't bear fruit. Then in verse 2, Jesus begins to unpack this analogy now that he's set the stage for us and tells us who's playing which part. In verse 2, he says this, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And the question is why? That it may bear more fruit. And guys, right here, you're gonna notice at the end of verse two is the very purpose of this entire analogy, okay? The very purpose is that every person would experience the spiritual blessings of connecting to and communing with God. That's the point. If you're taking notes, that's what it means to bear fruit. It literally means this. To bear fruit means to experience the blessings and the benefits and the byproducts of a relationship with Jesus. And you do that by connecting to him by faith and communing with him daily. That's what we see what bearing fruit is all about. And that's exactly the emphasis of this passage. And guys, that's what we're going to unpack through the rest of today's sermon. It's how do we experience the blessings and benefits of a relationship with Jesus? How do we connect with him by faith? And then how do we commune with him in such a way that our life is fruitful and joyful? That's what this passage is all about. So number one, here's the first thing we're going to see. If we want to be fruitful in this way, we would experience God in this way, we must be connected to the right vine. That's the first thing we're going to see. Look at verse one again. It says this, I am the true vine, Jesus says, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, guys, in this verse, Jesus is pulling from some ancient imagery, okay, that's used in the Old Testament, where ancient Israel is portrayed, actually, as God's vine. In Psalm 80, verse 8, the psalmist wrote, you removed a vine from Egypt. Remember, they were in slavery uh, in Egypt for uh, a few centuries, and God brought them out. That's what it's referring to. You removed a vine from Egypt, and you drove out all the nations and planted it. And through the prophet Jeremiah, God said this of Israel, I planted you a choice vine, a completely faithful seed. For the Old Testament, guys, God was using uh, ancient Israel to be a channel in which that God's blessings and covenant faithfulness would kind of flow out to the world. And now Jesus is saying in verse 1 that he is now that vine. He is now that channel in which God's blessings flow to the world. Jesus is the true vine, he's saying. The true vine that Israel in the Old Testament was pointing forward to all along. And so just hours before his death, at this famous Last Supper, Jesus is declaring to us his seventh and final I am statement to his disciples. Remember, we've heard this. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection. I am the bread. I am the all of these I am's, right? And now he gets to his final one and he says, as God in human flesh, he says, I am the true vine. Meaning that he is the only true source, guys, of spiritual life, of vitality, of growth and sustenance. He's the only source. So that's why he uses that word, I am the true vine. I am the only vine that can bring you life. 
vitality, sustenance, strength. Or in other words, he uses the analogy, just as branches depend on the vine for life and to grow fruit, so do followers of Jesus. We must depend completely on Jesus as the source of our spiritual life, our growth, our vitality, and everything that we are. And if not, we begin to wither away. So there's one more thing I want you to note here in these verses. It's, do you know why else, though, Jesus calls himself the true vine? Like, why else does he call himself the true vine, not just the vine? Well, because he knows that there are other vines that you and I try to connect to for life, right? And there's three in particular that I think or we see in culture. I think the first thing we struggle with that other vine is the self-vine. I think we're often looking inward to ourself for some sort of self-fulfillment or a certain way of self-expression. And if we can just find ourselves internally and we know our purpose or our calling or who we truly are or how we identify, we feel like if we can truly live out that expression, then we will have life abundant, the fulfilling life. If we can tap into the authentic, deepest, true self, then we will have life. And actually, Jesus tells us later in the Gospels that we actually find our life by losing our life. It's when we give ourselves over to Jesus and trust his will and his ways, do we find life in him. So it's not a deeper dive into the submarine of self, trying to locate our most authentic self, and then if we can express that, then we'll be fulfilled. It's no, we've got to find the one who actually designed us, the one who actually made us, the one who has a blueprint for our joy that knows how we're designed and where joy can be found and where happiness is. And God is saying, I I'm the true vine. When you connect to me, not just self-vine, do you find life? Another vine we often try to connect with is the other's vine. I didn't have another better title for this, so it's just the other's vine. And here's what we often do for this one. We sort of try to tether ourselves to a dating relationship, or we do this in marriage. We sometimes as parents, if you're a parent, you try to do this through your children. You kind of live through them, and you rise in pride when your kid does well, and you're just discouraged and shut down if your kid is acting bad or poorly. You feel like it's a reflection of yourself. We do this with friendships and all kinds of relationships, we tether ourselves to others thinking that if they can love us or if we can prove our worth to them, then we can find life in vitality. Then we will belong and matter. And Jesus is telling us, no, I, I'm the true vine. You want to know what love is? You want to belong? You want to feel like someone is sacrificing themselves to serve and care for you? I'm the true vine. I'm what gives you life and sustenance, not the other's vine. And then the last one is the opportunity vine. Opportunity vine is what we often try to connect ourselves to bring about some sort of comfort or joy in our life. So we tether ourselves to success or a status. Uh, it's good to have an education, but sometimes we like to collect degrees in order to boost our inner self-confidence, thinking that if I had this degree or this job or I got promoted, then it would be something. So we tether ourselves to opportunities, like even adventure, a vacation, escape, some materialism, some new outfit, some new style, in order to feel like you have a freshness in your life, to cope with the hardships. And again, Jesus is saying, no, I'm the true vine. I'm where refuge is found. I'm where comfort and rest is found. It's not in any of those materialism things that begin to wash away with life or begin to deteriorate in your life or the shine goes away. Jesus is saying that, hey, I'm the only true vine. So church, here's one thing I would like to, to share with you here. Guys, we've got to stop trying to graft ourselves into some vines that are just empty. And that's what we're often doing in life. We're trying to graft ourselves to vines that are just going to leave you more empty and longing for deeper things where Christ is just actually inviting you through this passage. Nope, you, you want life and love and belonging, security, comfort? It's, it's here. It's knowing what I've done for you on the cross. It's seeing who I am in my sovereign care of your life. It's knowing that when you fear the future, he already knows the future. He's ushering you into that. Guys, we see this in all of life, right? That everyone, including me, including you, we're trying to tether ourselves to some vine to bring us life. 
Guys, right now in this moment, you notice that probably our nation is struggling in the political realm. We are struggling and we are wanting to tether ourselves to some political candidate or some political party. And the political vine is a huge one we're trying to tether ourselves to. We think that maybe this blue vine or this red vine or this green party vine will give us life and vitality. And so we think that if we can just plug into that vine and usher in that candidacy and this particular political party, then it will bring in the peace and joy that we're all looking for in this nation. But as we know, we can't, we can't tether ourselves and give our full commitment to any political candidate. It's only Christ. And this is what Jesus is inviting us to see today. Guys, even another way we do this is in the self vine, uh, we're often trying to kind of boost ourselves or um, further develop ourselves, and it can become kind of an addiction. Uh, if, I just went to um, Barnes and Nobles the other uh, week with my kids, and they were doing a readathon with school, and so we bought some books, went to the library and read some books, and uh, there was just all these like competition with the school about raising money and doing books. And it was super exciting for our kids; they love it. But as I was going through Barnes and Nobles, I realized that there's these the, kind of a kid section. There's like a comic book section. There's a fantasy section. There's like a biography section. There's all these sections in the in the uh, in, in Barnes and Nobles. But the biggest section that is there is the self help section. It's like half of the store is like how to be a better you, be a better spouse, be more dateable, how to be more effective at your job, how to like deal with difficult people. It's like this whole entire thing is like self-help. It's like half of the bookstore. And in this verse, Jesus is declaring again that the self cannot be the vine. He's declaring that life and love and our longings are not found in having the right president, the right education, the right legislation, the right relationships, the right experiences, the right self-help, we must be connected to Jesus, the right vine. So it begs the question for us guys this morning. Are you connected, truly connected, truly communing with Jesus as the right vine? He says he's the true one, but who are you truly connected to? Now here's what I don't mean. If, if you're already a Christian, you've placed your faith in Jesus, you're connected with him, but that word abide doesn't just mean connected. It means that you are communing with him. You are communing in daily deep relationship with Jesus. And that's what I'm asking you. Are you communing with the right vine or are you looking to other vines that are not the true vine? Like have you truly and genuinely trusted Jesus to be that vine of love and truth and grace in your life? Or have you trusted political candidates or religious action or some other relationship or material or experience in your life to bring you life? Guys, I want you to hear the invitation that Jesus is saying over and over in this passage, guys. Verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 10 all say the same thing. He says, abide in me and let my love abide in you. And what is that love? A love that Jesus poured out through his death on the cross for you so that you could be forgiven, you could be freed, and you could be fueled to live and walk with this Jesus, which is life. So if you wanna be fruitful and experience all the goodness of this life that God has for you, you must be connected to the right vine. Number two, guys, if you wanna be fruitful and experiencing the blessings of being connected to and communing with God, you must let the vine dresser do his job. Okay, this is not gonna be a fun section, by the way. So just kind of buckle up, get ready. Not a fun section. It's kind of an insider to the Christian world about how God leads us and how he cares for us, but it doesn't feel good when he does it. And this is what he does in verse two. He prunes us, verse two, or sorry, verse one and verse two again. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the vine dresser is doing two things. He's taking away branches that don't produce fruit. And then he is pruning those who do bear fruit. Now, in order for most plants to flourish, I learned through studying, not my own experience, they must be pruned. These plants must be cut back. For example, rose bushes. They need to be pruned because the vines then turn in on themselves and it actually chokes out the plant if you don't cut it back. And when this happens, the bush will overtake the roses, then 
the light of the sun cannot get to the roses. And then you end up with these ugly little roses rather than vibrant, healthy, huge roses. And the same thing happens with grapevines. They need pruning because when you have all these little vines and all the energy is kind of diverted to everywhere else other than the grapes, you end up with all these little small and puny grapes rather than healthy, flavorful grapes. So the vine dresser must do this job and he must prune. Because if not, the vine or the plant will turn in on itself and die. And guys, spiritually speaking, I see this happen all the time in relationships. Here's what I see in dating and here's what I see in marriage. There's a certain couple that turns in on itself, looking to the other person to bear the weight of everything in their life. They look to the other person to fulfill all their hopes and dreams and goals and desires. And you've probably seen this too in relationships, or maybe you've been in one at times. And that relationship that turns inward on itself becomes a self-destructive relationship. The relationship implodes and the couple walks away and they're hurt and they're angry and they're jaded and alone. And the question is why? Because a relationship with a significant other that's not Christ cannot handle the weight of your greatest fears and worries and wants and desires. It begins to turn in on itself, trying to find life in itself rather than life in the vine. And only God can sustain our greatest hopes and fears and worries and wants and desires. So Christian, let me, let me ask you, why does God prune you? Why does he cut back some certain things in your life? Certain relationships and opportunities and finances or he allows hardship. Why does he do that? It's so that you don't turn in on yourself and look to yourself and other things for life. And so what he does is he cuts off false sources of life that you and I have clinged to that are actually choking you out. And so he prunes us so that we don't turn in on ourselves and destroy ourselves. And here's three ways that I think I see God doing this. There's sort of a positional pruning that happens. And we see this a lot in Boston with a lot of, of Christians. Someone's working really hard in school or their job and they didn't get in the program that they wanted or they didn't get the job that they desired. They didn't get the funding or the grant that they wanted. And they begin to deal with this sort of identity crisis. If I don't get good grades or if I don't get this grant, who am I? If I didn't get promoted at this job and I'm not seen as significant and I get, can't get to the place I want to in life, then, then who really am I? And people begin to go through this identity crisis. And what I think God's doing in his grace is not punishing, he's pruning. He's pruning and saying, maybe I'm not going to allow this particular job or this particular schooling or this particular relationship to happen in order to grow something better in your life because you're looking to this job or this school or this program to be your life. And so in love, God cut something in order for you not to turn in on yourself and be destroyed, to wreck your life, to harm yourself. It's a very odd way when we think about God's love and care. It doesn't feel like that's loving for God to cut something that seems like it would be good in our life. But if we let a good thing become a God thing, then that's an idol. And when we serve an idol, that idol actually begins to crush us. We can't live in the flourishing of that idol. Another thing we see, two more things here. We see there's often a relational pruning that I talked about earlier. And we see this happen when there's in really unhealthy relationships. We see a marriage begin to struggle. We see a dating relationship begin to struggle. And we see some relational pruning. Sometimes a dating couple has to break up because they put all the weight of their life on this other person. Meet my hopes and my dreams and my desires sexually. And they just crush the other person with all their desires that they cannot live up to. And we see this in marriages as well. We, we don't fully put our trust in who Christ is and have a godly expectation for community. And we just, if we just put it all on our spouse, we crush them with the weight of our expectations. And only Christ can handle the weight of our deepest longings and our greatest desires. And so we put those on him through prayer and ask him to lead us and guide us. And last we see there is a material pruning. Guys, sometimes God does in his grace and sovereignty, sometimes God does allow certain hardships to happen materialistically. There might be a job that gets, you get fired from or you get transitioned from. There might be a financial hardship in your family. 
And in that time, you notice that you begin to panic and have a ton of anxiety because maybe all of your worth and value were connected to your bank account rather than Christ. And so what God may allow happen is some sort of intermediate financial frustration or difficulty to, for you to see that your hope was really in your money and not in him. And so in grace, he redirects not to punish you, but to prune you so that you don't find your life in money. Because when that money goes away, then so does your life. And so rather than you destroying yourself and letting God just let you go to the end of that, he tries to turn you through pruning. And he may cut off certain positions or relationships or certain material things in your life in order to give you better life in him. This is sort of a hard teaching, right? Sort of a difficult thing that we experience as Christians. Now, guys, if you've ever seen a plant after a gardener is done pruning it, it looks like a disaster. You thought the gardener hates the plant. Guys, things that look perfectly good at the beginning look terrible at the end, if you've seen it. There's like plants all over the ground and there's fruit everywhere and there's vines and branches all over the ground. It looks terrible. And so why would God do this if it's painful and if it looked like that? Because the pain of not pruning, guys, is worse than the pain of pruning itself. God loves you enough to have certain things be cut off in your life in order for you to have better life in him. The pain of not pruning is worse than the pain of pruning itself because God always wants to prune us in order to provide a better thing for us in him. Because I had a really good, uh, he's a really good friend now, but he was one of my students when I was a student pastor in North Carolina. And this friend, his name was Chris, he had really bad scoliosis in his back ever since he was a kid. He was a super tall gentleman, and I think now he's like 6'6 six, six or 6'7 six, or something like that. And um, he had really bad scoliosis in high school where his, his back was hunched over and it was also curved uh, pretty tremendously. He had a lot of back pain, a lot of difficulty. And his family and him decided that he needed to have surgery to correct the scoliosis in his back because it was keep getting worse as he got older and older. And so Chris got this terrible surgery that was hurtful for him and straightened out his back with all these rods and screws and had a long recovery period. But from that, Chris now doesn't have back pain. He's able to not have to bend over. He's able to play sports and work on his feet a lot longer outside. And it's a healthier thing for him. And so he would retell and say, that surgery was awful. It was terrible. It hurt. The recovery was miserable. But that surgery produced something better in my life. And I'm healthier now because of that. And that's the principle of pruning. That God may take something that is bent over in on itself in your life. And in order to preserve and to care for you, God will prune that in your life so that you can have better life in him. It's not punishment. It's pruning. It's caring. It's redirecting. Guys, this is also why suffering is just so effective in the Christian life. It's not that God is causing the suffering, but he might be allowing some sort of suffering. In order for that suffering to pull up some of the roots and soil that you have dug yourself into to find life. And so he uses suffering to kind of work the soil and pull up the vines and the roots and replant you in the gospel of Jesus. For you to find your hope in him, your life in him, your identity in him. And guys, that's, that's what we're seeing in my family right now with my mom and her cancer diagnosis and the struggles my family's had medically, is that all of that, God is not causing it, but he is using it in order for our family to be better unified together, for us to experience hard conversations of love and forgiveness that we've not reconciled since childhood. He's pruning certain things in our life through the difficulty of my family's medical diagnosis in order to do something better in our hearts. So did God give my mom cancer? I don't believe so, but he gave us a gift. He used the cancer to give us the gift of a better relationship with him, better unity within my family. And then one day he gives us this better hope that yes, one day in heaven, all of this is going to be dealt with. Everything will be healed. Everything will be fixed. And that's the goodness of what God is reminding of in our family. Verse three, we keep seeing more things he's teaching here about this pruning. Verse three, already he says, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Now, on the surface, it seems like Jesus like flips analogies here. He's talking about cutting and pruning, but then all of a sudden he's talking about cleaning. What does he mean here? Well, guys, in, in Greek, which I don't 
know like I could just like speak Greek to you now, but in my Greek studies of this passage, there's this connection of words that's kind of missing for us in English here. He's not switching metaphors. That word clean that you already clean means stripped. You were already stripped of something. And Jesus, what he's saying here is you've already been stripped. You've already been pruned of the ultimate problem we have as people, which is the record and the penalty of sin in our life. And Jesus is saying that he has already, by when we trust in him, he's already cleaned or pruned or canceled that debt at the cross. And he's washed it away from us through his death on our behalf. And now that the heavenly pruning of sin has been dealt with at the cross, God the Father as our vine dresser continues the earthly pruning so that we don't turn in on ourselves and harm ourselves. And he's doing this by continually, guys, turning you away over and over again from useless pursuits that harm you. And so guys, let me just ask you, what are those areas that you keep turning to over and over again? Where do you see God's pruning in your life? If you're a Christian, it's happening. He wants you to produce more fruit, more joy, more love in your life. And so he's pruning you. Where is that happening? Where is struggle and strife? Where might be there sadness or hardship? It's in that area that I want you to see that God's actually being merciful to you. I know it's hard for us to maybe imagine, but God's being merciful because he's producing something in you. It's fruit. And through that hardship of the pruning, through the cutting off of certain things in your life, he is creating something in you that's going to be better. You might not be able to see it, but in time you will experience it. You'll see the fruit that he produces. The gardener takes out things in our life only that are bad to keep and that are better for us to lose. That's what the vine dresser is doing. It's painful, it's difficult, it's hard, but it's worth it. You've got to let the vine dresser do his job and prune you. Let me just ask you guys, is there any area that you're just resisting God? Any area that you're resisting him where he's reminding your heart and mind that maybe you shouldn't live that way with your money? Maybe you should reconsider how you're living out your sexuality. Maybe we should consider what's our relational, uh, our relationships look like in this church and the expectations we have on one another. What are we doing with our material and our expectations for adventure and how they're supposed to satisfy us? Like, where do you feel that God is beginning to prune you? And are you being resistant to it or are you receiving it? Are you allowing God's work to be done in your life? Because guys, the more and more we resist Christ, the less fruit of joy happens in us. And when we let God have his way and we turn and repent and follow the path he's taking us, the better joy and life is being found in him. Number three, if you want to be fruitful, you must learn how to abide now in the vine. We talked about being connected to the right vine. You got to let the father prune things in your life and remove things that are going to harm you. But now we talk about you must abide. How do you actually abide in the vine? Verse four and five says this, abide in me, Jesus says, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And now we're getting at the main push of this passage. Plants grow as they abide or remain in connection to the vine. Therefore, a branch has no life in and of itself, but its life is in its connection to the vine, and then the vine grows life through the branches. So guys, in the same way as Christians, we have no spiritual life in and of ourselves. We have no true joy, no true love just in and of ourselves. But if we abide in Jesus, the life of him flows in and through us through the Holy Spirit. Guys, in fact, again, that's what that word abide is getting at. It's this Greek word, mino, and it literally means make your home in. Guys, to abide in something means that we are to remain fixed in that place, to endure steadfast in one place. That's what it means to abide. And in this context, it refers to us having an unbroken communion that stays steadfast with Jesus. 
I don't mean just once saved and you trusted in Jesus and now you have a relationship with him and then that's what abide means. Like, no, that means you've trusted in Jesus. You have a relationship with him. Abide means how are you growing in that relationship? You're connected by faith, but are you growing? Are you abiding? Are you daily communing to what you are connected to? Because I think for many of us, we just want our sins to be dealt with and the guilt. We just want to go to heaven one day And so we're like, sure, I guess we'll trust in Jesus. But are you daily communing with him? Are you abiding in him? And that's what Jesus is offering and encouraging you in this passage. Also, he's saying this in verse five. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, guys, nothing doesn't mean like nothing. It doesn't mean you can't like wake up or raise your arm. It doesn't mean like nothing. It means nothing of eternal value. It means that there's nothing with real vitality and life in it that's not connected to Jesus. And guys, I think that that's what we're all looking for. Guys, we are some of the most, millennials, Gen Z's, the most depressed, the most anxious generation that's ever happened in American history. And the question is why? Because we are looking to everything else to try to connect us to life and vitality, to meaning and purpose, to being wanted and being significant, and we're not finding it. I know this sounds cheesy. That my, I was talking to my kids last night, and they're like, Daddy, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And so I like try to reference it a little bit. And uh, then they're like, well, what does that mean? Uh, uh, you know, like uh, Emily was like, Emily, uh, Aaron, give them an example of what you're talking about tomorrow. It's a little cheesy. And I was like, well, it's like everyone's trying to look on their phones in order to find life. So they're looking online to find life rather than the vine. And my kids are like, oh, gosh, Dad, that was a terrible, terrible dad joke, which is a terrible dad joke. But I think that's exactly in some sense what's happening with us. We're trying to find life just online. Literally, guys, we spend so much time on our phones, on the computer, more than any generation we've ever seen before. Guys, national numbers, so the average American spend four hours and 30 minutes on their phone. You're like, I spend more than that. That's right, because I haven't gotten to you yet. Millennials, Gen Z, we spend nine hours on the internet on average a day, nine hours. And we're just scrolling and surfing and clicking and commenting. And some of us are just like quiet trolls. Like, you have, you have a social media page, but all you do is just look at everybody else's. You don't post anything. You don't comment. You just creep on everybody else's stuff. And I'm not like dogging on you for that. But what you're seeing is that you're looking at everyone else's highlight reel and you're just kind of comparing it to your blooper reel of your life. And you're like, this person's living a great life. Look at their vacation. Look at what they own. You look at these influencers. You're like, I'd love to do that with my life. And you just feel more depressed, depressed, depressed. And have you ever gotten off of social media and be like, I'm glad I did that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe you've jumped off social media, you quit social media and you feel better about it. But usually once you're done with social media for like an hour or two, you don't feel better. You often feel more anxious, more depressed, more sad. Why? Because you've looked online literally to be a vine for you. And that's exactly why our generation is some of the most depressed and anxious that we've seen. One of the best ways pragmatically for us to abide in the vine is just get off social media. Like take a break, get a breather, don't get on it, like, unless you're following the church account and then follow the church account and look at the stuff there. I'm just kidding, kind of. But find some way to get sort of a soul detox. Guys, even on your phone, like, set yourself like a timer or some sort of app that tracks your screen time, that tells you how much time you spent, and just evaluate how much time am I spending in word and prayer and how much I'm spending online. And just evaluate those two things and then look at your life and be like, that's why I'm angry. That's why I'm anxious. That's why I have political rage. Because you spent more time looking at the Boston Globe or the Atlantic or the New York Times rather than the Word of God. And guys, we've got to abide in Christ. He's offering himself to you a moment. So guys, where do you abide? When you get home from your work, when you go to work, Where are you looking for life and comfort and peace, rest and intimacy? Where are you looking for it? Because that's that's the place you're trying to connect to. And guys, Jesus is saying, let him be the true and ultimate vine of comfort and peace and rest and intimacy. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Meaning we cannot have life and joy and peace without being connected to him. So what are you more connected to in your life? Him or some other vine? Now, guys, this passage is interesting here. Uh, There was like 10 things I had to say. I'm just going to boil it down to two. 
uh, for sake of time, and I already planned for two of those, not 10. But we have to ask the question, what is the fruit that he's talking about here? Are some of us gonna like grow a grape or grow a watermelon on our physical bodies? Of course not, right? Verse five, it says this, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So what is this spiritual fruit that we would produce by being connected to Jesus? As a popular misconception kind of equates fruit with outward success. It means that I have status now and I have money and I have comfort and possessions. And that's what some traditions think that that's what fruit is. You get more money, you get more success, the more faithful you are in your relationship with God. But that's not what we're saying. That's not what spiritual fruit means according to scriptures. It means two things. First, when we're connected to Jesus in daily rich communion in word and prayer with him, the fruit of godly character is produced. The fruit of godly character. Galatians 5 really outlines this. The the Bible defines fruit in terms of spiritual qualities, not materialistic qualities. The fruit of the Spirit, as Paul describes in Galatians 5, is this. This is what gets produced in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passages and desires, is what the text says. So let me just ask you, you ask this of yourself also. Are you producing those fruits in your life? Are you more loving than you were last year? Are you more joyful than you were last year? Are you more peace-filled than you were last year? Are you more patient with those that make it struggle to be patient with? Are you more kind? Are you more good? Are you more faithful? Are you more gentle? Are you more self-controlled this year than you were last year? If the answer is no, it means you are communing with a different vine. This is a great time for us to assess ourselves here. Most of us in this room, you know what the fruits of the Spirit are, but they're not produced in your life. And why? Because you're not communing with Christ the vine. In fact, you are anxious and angry and often frustrated and harsh and sharp and not self-controlled and were kind and good only to manipulate something out of somebody else is often what happens to us. And that's not a rebuke to anyone in particular, but that's often what happens. We have marks of the flesh, not the fruits of the Spirit. And so guys, just look at those lists in Galatians 5 and ask yourself, am I producing better fruit in my life? Because the more I spend time with Jesus, Jesus is loving, Jesus is kind, Jesus is joy-filled, Jesus is where peace is found. Jesus is patient, he's kind, he's good, he's faithful, he's gentle, he's self-controlled. And the more I spend time with him, I can't help but to turn into some of his attributes. You've seen that in your friendships, right? The more you hang out with a certain type of friend, the more you become like them, right? The more time you spend with Jesus in word and prayer, you commune with him, then you begin to develop the same qualities that he has. And if you're not developing more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, you're not producing more of that, then you're not communing with Christ. I want you to produce more of this as we abide in him for your good and for others' good. The other fruit that we see produced is not just character, but it's a gospel ministry. Guys, every Christian, if you're a Christian in the room, we should have a ministry in the church and a mission in the world. If you're a Christian, you should have a ministry in the church and a mission in the world. And God wants us to have this gospel fruit of ministry, this sort of sacrificial love for one another in the church, but also some sort of witness in the world. Guys, the Bible defines those who have trusted in Jesus as spiritual fruit, actually. Paul expresses his desire for Christians in Rome to witness with the grace and truth to those who are also in the city of Rome so they would know Jesus too. He says this, I do not want you to be unaware, beloved, that often I have planned to come to you so that I may obtain some fruit, Paul says, among you and even among some of the Gentiles. It's Romans 1, 13. Even Colossians says that Paul rejoices in all the world that the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. So what does this mean? It means that part of the fruit that God wants to produce in our life is not just character, but also our witness to the world. God wants the fruit of your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, your roommates to know him. 
And Jesus calls that spiritual fruit. It's through your character and through your witness of sharing the good news of what Jesus has done, he wants to harvest the spiritual fruit of many people in Boston from every tribe and nation and tongue and background, status. He wants a spiritual harvest of people that have come to faith in Christ. And so what he produces by way of fruit in you are those two things, your character and your witness. So let me ask you this question. When you think about when's the last time you shared the good news of Jesus with somebody? When's the last time you genuinely had a loving, gracious conversation with a coworker about faith, about what you believe, about what they believed? And I'm not, not asking, were you harsh or hostile or did you force some weird gospel conversation with them? I'm just like, when's the last time you genuinely shared the good news of Jesus with someone? And if it's been like over a week and a month and six months and a year, and you're like, I don't remember the last time I've shared that, then we've got to assess, am I really producing the fruit of the Spirit. Because what we're excited about and what we love most is what we share most. Even today, I was so excited about the rights having their baby and getting permission from them to share and then sharing with you guys. And I hear good news from you when you get a promotion or you get a raise or you had a good conversation with someone, you got engaged or you went to visit family or your favorite sports team. I hear all about that, whether, you, whether I want to hear it or not, which of course I want to hear it, but you share everything with me sometimes. And with other people in the church, you share what you're excited about because it's kind of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. And if your heart is tethered to the true vine, then you will witness and you will share the good news of Jesus with people. So the question is, are you sharing the gospel with people? Who are you sharing Christ with? And if not, let us commune more with him so we experience the joy of our salvation again and we're willing to share that with our non-Christian friends and neighbors. So let's end with this, guys. How do we actually do it? How do we connect with Christ? How do we do it? Four ways. God's word, God's love, God's will, and God's people. That's how. We see the first one in verse 7 and 8 briefly. God's word. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You can ask for whatever you wish. He's teaching us about prayer. And it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Fruit of your character, fruit of your witness. And so prove to be my disciples. Now, guys, what he's saying here is that when you read your Bible, you read God's word every day, you will experience God's love more in your life. You will experience, you will be aware of it. Now, does it mean that if you read it, God will love you more? No, it means that you will experience, you will be aware of God's love. Guys, Jesus kept the law perfectly in your place. There's no way that you can add more of God's love for you because Jesus already did it by living in your place. And you can't just add to God's love for you by just reading your Bible a couple times more each week. But when you read the Bible, guys, you're reminded of the truth of God's love for you. How far away our hearts tend to run and that God is patient to come after us and bring us back to him over and over again. And when you're mindful of that, that God abides in you even when we don't abide in him, We are over flooded with God's love because we see it in God's word. And as you saturate your heart in the story of God's greatness and his love for you, it becomes a part of who you are and aligns your heart with the gospel. So guys, that's the challenge. The challenge is not earning God's love. The challenge is living in constant awareness of God's love for you. Guys, the hard work of Christianity is not earning God's love. It's believing that God's love for you was given to you every single day because of the cross. And when you're in God's word, that's how you abide in him. So guys, pick up a church reading plan. Just pick up a copy of the Bible. ESV is a great translation. If you don't have one in your seats, there's blue ones. If you don't have one at home, take one home and maybe start in the book of John and just read the Bible. Read the Bible, maybe a chapter each day. Take the church's Bible reading plan that we're going through all of the New Testament Read it and abide in his word and experience his love. Which leads us to number two of how we abide. We abide in his love, it says in verse nine. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in it. Now guys, listen, I love my wife. I love my wife, Emily. We've been married for 11 years. We've known each other for like 13 years. And it's not good enough if I just connected to Emily on the day we got married. We hugged each other. We said, I do in front of our friends and our family. And then we put on rings and I said, love you, bye. I'll see you in 11 years. I'm connected to her legally through marriage, 
But would you say that's a faithful marriage? A a marriage that has a chance of thriving and flourishing? You'd, You'd say no. It's the constant communion with Emily. It's abiding in one another's love. And that's what Jesus is saying, that yes, you already are connected to him, but are you abiding in him? Are you communing with him? And guys, this is what we experience when we pray. That's what we saw in a couple of verses ago. And Jesus saying, if you abide in my word, then you begin to pray. And you ask anything in my name, anything according to my word and my will, and I'm giving it to you and you're experiencing God's love in this way. Guys, one of the ways we do this at our church is when we take communion, we take communion, we're abiding in God's love. We're reminding ourselves of how we've sinned and fallen short. And then we're reminded of what God did to love and forgive us in that sin. That's one way of how we abide in God's love. Guys, even for me, I've just shared before, I, I keep a prayer journal of all the times I've asked God for things and what he's done to answer. And I've got pages and pages and pages and books and books filled with God answering prayers. And I'm reminded of how God loves me. That's one way of abiding in his love. Number three, how do we abide in his love? We abide in his will. His will found in verse 10. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Guys, it might be difficult to consider, but how do we abide in God's love? It really is following his commands. Now, I know that when we think about following his commands, it feels like, oh, God, you're going to limit me. Or, ah, oh, it's, it's kind of like a difficult thing. I don't really want to follow you. I don't really want to do what you have to say. It kind of feels like you're going to restrict me from some sort of happiness or freedom. Because obedience to his commands is really the fence. The fence that protects you from harm and promotes your joy. It allows you to have more love and experience him better. And guys, this is why I love when I take my kids to a park that has a fence in there. When we play kickball, I'm grateful that we have a fence because we're all kicking it into the fence and it's always going foul and that fence is keeping the ball in rather than us have to go and run after the ball and leave the game. Or when my kids go to play in the park, I know that they're safe and they're in the bounds of playing with whatever they want to in the fence. And that's what God is saying. I'm gonna give some commands as a fence, not to limit you from joy, but to ensure that you have joy. I, God designed us to live in a certain way so that we experience him in life to its fullest. So guys, anytime God gives you a law, a command in scripture, it's not to limit you, it's to liberate you to a better place of joy in life. So let us keep his commands. That's his will. You would obey him. And when you obey him, you're learning to experience him. And when you experience him, you're learning how loving, how wise his commands really are. Guys, for me to be standing before you as a married man to one woman, to be a Christian and to be a pastor would blow your mind if you met me in high school. I didn't want to be married. I wanted to have as multiple partners as I wanted. I thought Christians were stupid. I thought pastors were dumb. And I never thought church planting would ever be in my future. In fact, on the way to my high school, there was a church plant that got planted and I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. So my friends started to go, this is super stupid. Why would anyone plant a church? The church is everywhere. Here I am saying before you, all of those things in reverse. It's interesting that God has changed my mind and heart. And I imagine as you get older and you're you're maturing in Christ and you're experiencing these commands, you're like, yeah, there's, there's something wise about what God says about life and relationships and our bodies and our hopes and dreams and where life is found. His commands are good. When I became a Christian, I looked at these commands. I'm like, yeah, God, there's something wise you're doing. Because when I live this way with my mind and my body and my actions and my money, it only led to more heartache and harm. And Hollywood and social media promised me that I would like feel this way if I lived this way, but I, I don't. And so when we keep his commands, it's not to limit you. It's actually to liberate you to have better love, better joy, better life. And that's what connecting to the vine is. And then last is God's people. God's people. We abide by connecting with God's people. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another in verse 12 and 13. That you love one another as I have loved you. Guys, we abide in Christ indirectly by also abiding in his people. Guys, when you spend time in community group, you come to church like this, you have deep conversations over meals and coffee and you're relating to one another who has the Holy Spirit in them, you are growing in Christ. When someone knows you and knows the Bible and they can speak that into you, you grow. And God is saying that. If you love one another, 
That's my command, to love one another. That's how you abide in Christ. So who are you spending time with? Are you connecting to people in our church? Are you reaching out to others and saying, hey, I'd like to get coffee with you. Hey, can we grab a meal sometime? Are you initiating those? Or are you just waiting for those to be initiated to you? This command says that you are to love one another as God has loved you. And then this passage wraps up with a warning and a wanting of how we abide. The warning is sharp and it's harsh. It says it in verse six, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers and the branches are gathered and they're thrown into the fire and burned. Guys, here's the hard truth here, okay? 13% of Jesus' teachings, roughly 13% on the topics of hell and judgment. And he's saying here in the context of John 13, where Judas leaves the meal as a fallen branch because he's rejected Jesus. Jesus given Judas multiple times to turn and to trust in him. And Judas has fallen away. And Jesus is teaching us that proximity to Jesus does not mean unity to Jesus. Jesus Judas had all the proximity. He followed Jesus for three years. But just because you go to church and you read your Bible and you grew up Catholic or you, you've done some kind, good moral things in your life, proximity to religion doesn't make you unified with God. And so in this passage, we have a warning. If we are not trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus alone for our salvation, then we are not connected to him. If we try to staple on fruit to ourself, I'll vote for this person, I'll do a good deed, I'll give money, I'll be a religious person. Just staple goodness on you. That's not abiding in the vine. Goodness must be produced through you by what Jesus has done for you on the cross. In this passage, he's saying, if you have not placed your faith and trust in Jesus, then it leads to lifelessness. And in the end, we must receive the justice for our sins against God. And in this passage, Jesus is saying, I want to give you a warning. If you've not trusted in me, if you've not accepted that you're a sinner that's fallen from the standard that God has set, if you've not accepted that and accepted your need for Jesus and trusted that he lived, died, and rose for you, then this is the outcome. It's a warning, and he's using Judas as this warning. But then he gives you a wanting. He gives you an invitation. He says, see, I've spoken these things to you, that my joy may be in you. He doesn't want that to be the outcome for you, hell. He doesn't want a throwing away. He doesn't want that judgment for you. He gives that warning, so he gives you the one thing. This is what I want for you. These things I've spoken to you so that you may have joy, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Guys, this is what theologians call the crowning blessing of spiritual fruit. It's a fullness of joy, a joy that is produced when you genuinely and unceasingly abide in daily communion with Christ. Jesus promised to impart believers his joy, the joy that he shares with God the Father. He promises to give it to you. That's the one thing. He wants you to abide and stay connected and walk with him in his word and prayer with his people, obey his commands. He wants you to have joy. So he says, abide in me as I abide in you. So church, again, how are you abiding in Christ? You may have connected with him by trust and faith, but are you communing with him? So church, let us take this passage seriously and consider what Jesus is saying. Let's be connected to the right vine. Let's let God the Father prune things in our life. And let's abide in him through his word, through his love, his will, and his people. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the goodness and the simplicity of this passage. Lord, I pray that our church would be able to Heed the warnings and the wantings that you have here. God, we look to all sorts of things to tether our life to, to find joy and life and meaning and love and belonging. And God, I pray that today you will redirect our attention onto you. It can't be found in a relationship. It can't be found in a job or security or money or rest and comfort. Life is found in you and in this passage you warn us of what it looks like for someone who's not trusted in you and they try to find life somewhere else. They ultimately, they ultimately are cast away. 
And Lord, in this passage is an invitation not to just connect by faith, but to abide daily with you. Lord, I pray that our church would do that. We would experience the joy that this passage promises us. The joy that you have with God the Father. And I pray that you would give us that as we walk with you daily. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.